Do you believe that life once returned to the dead body of a man in Palestine? Do you believe that blood flowed again in his veins? And do you believe that as his spirit rose from the dead, it left behind an image of the man on the cloth that had covered his tortured body? If you so believe, then you will not question whose face is now before you. For this is the face on the holy shroud of Turin. Good morning from uh, Iparana. My name is Peter Millward and um, this is my testimony that uh, I'm going to talk about. And um, I've been wanting to do this for a while and so I'm going to read it out but I'm going to try and... Anyway, here goes. Um, let me explain, I've been an artist for most of my life and um, I made a picture about two years ago or a year ago about my testimony. But anyway, um, I will explain. The picture is my visual interpretation of what happened the night I took a break from painting a battle picture and watched a TV programme about the Shroud of Turin in 1982. To understand one has to see through spiritual eyes. Two pictures in one. Uh, the picture that I made back in 1982 was about the charge of the Light Brigade paint and um, it took about two years and ten months if I remember correctly. And um, anyway, I last year or two years ago, I, I decided to uh, split the picture in two and include my testimony, which is why the, the picture that you see in the background, you'll see the center where God broke into my life and depicting the sword of the spirit, the word of God for a long time. I have had this battle picture in storage and uh, not knowing what to do with it, but for me it marks a tremendous turning point in my life and so I decided to make the battle picture divided and two hours and, and include my testimony. Just starting from the beginning of my testimony, little did I know when I began to the, this picture, the battle picture, there was another battle going on, a heavenly one. It was a battle which God won for my soul. As I grew up, I would often read stories of famous battles in history. I would often paint different battle pictures. So I found the story of the Charge of the Light Brigade very inspiring. When I was younger, I'd even seen the 1968 movie of the same name with my parents. So when I started the Charge of the Light Brigade in 1981, I was going to put all my effort into it up until then, I'd only made pictures which took a day or two or a week or two. But this was going to be different because this picture I was planning to enter for the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition in London. I was 21 years of age and had no idea how long the picture would take. It didn't matter. I was going to make a great picture, at least trying to. It took, but it took me one year alone for composition and sketching. In the picture that's halfway through. Anyway, uh, something special happened along the way. The most wonderful thing that happened in my entire life. And that's why I made these two pictures into one. It's my story, how God brought me to himself through Jesus Christ. The Charge of the Light Brigade painting has a lot of soldiers with swords, but there is another sword far sharper, which I want to show. It's the heavenly sword of the Holy Spirit called the Word of God. The, the scripture says, for the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, 
joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. It's this image of the sword of the spirit, the word of God, I wanted to depict. Cutting in half the charge of light brigade enabled me to show how God broke into my life and to show uh, my testimony. The picture of flying bricks of unbelief, what, whatever is this? The shroud of Turin on the TV screen and the fiery word of God, the sword of the spirit, bearing down upon a young man seated watching. What does this mean? To give some background to the picture, the shroud of Turin, this mysterious enigmatic piece of linen cloth, some believe to be the burial shroud of Jesus Christ, still fascinates and baffles even after all these centuries because it is so remarkable. Even if it is fake, it has to be the most remarkable work of art produced by any known or unknown artist, or any one for that matter. But what is even more intriguing is God should use the shredded Turin to ambush, as it were, an artist centuries later, a careless, unbelieving sinner, which I was. That artist is me. It's part of my story which took place in 1982, but now in recent times I started looking again after finding this old TV program about the Shroud on YouTube. It had been aired on British television all those years ago and I found it. It is, a very, it is very significant how we come to Christ. And so now I have been trying to understand better my own story and the Shroud of Turin and the Word of God. What is important to remember Whatever the enemy wants to use for evil, God always works it for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. My testimony as I grew up, there were times when I had definite experiences of God and his mercy. But it wasn't until I was 23 years of age, I experienced what the Bible describes as being born again of the spirit. In John chapter 3, verse 3 to 8. Up until that time, I was been basically living my own life to please myself never understanding what being a Christian really means. I was doing my own thing, living for myself. Then one night, I watched a program about the Shroud of Turin, which I should have read during the painting, which some think, some think is the burial shroud of Jesus. I was curious about this. I was just sitting back watching this program about the Shroud and as the program uh, progressed, um, a thought suddenly hit me. What if Jesus really is true and he's coming back? That was quite a shock to my system. The fact was I was living my life as if God didn't exist. And I knew that. And then I started to catch a glimpse of what Judgment Day means for those who do not, know, do not belong to Jesus. It was too, too horrifying. I knew I wasn't ready to meet him. I could dimly remember the scriptures that say about the wicked on judgment day will run to the rocks of the mountains and cry fallen us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand it's revelation chapter 6 verse 15 to 17 i could not rationalize or wriggle out of that that night i went upstairs looking for a gideon new testament which had been given to me by the gideons 
years before at school. I just had to check out what the Bible says about Judgment Day and what happens to the wicked. I was reading it off and on for a while, but the conviction grew and grew the more I read. I knew I was a sinner and I had to get right with God. I realize now it was the Holy Spirit convicting me who Jesus promised would come. John chapter 16, verse eight to 11. Finally, one night I knelt beside my bed, weeping. I started making my peace with God. That night, I yielded my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I knew my prayers had been heard. I had passed from death to life. A few days later, while reading the New Testament, I saw the awesome majesty of the Lord I had never seen before. I bowed my head and rested it on the New Testament. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. A power came into my life I had not known before. This was in November 1982. I became a Christian and it was the best thing that has ever happened to me. And you know, I still wonder and marvel what God did. I used to be afraid of death, but now I look forward to spending eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an amazing, wonderful hope. Jesus promised that whoever drinks the water he gives will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Those of us who have drunk the water Jesus gives will know the truth. The spring of water within is witnessing to us about the truth of his promise. It's something the world simply does not know or understand. Many people demand evidence before they will believe, and yet the evidence is there all along. If we would but drink the water Jesus gives, we would find evidence enough. Whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. So that ends the first part of my testimony. Uh, I got more parts of my testimony to share as I've, it'll be the 40th anniversary this November in 2022. So I'm uh, putting all my testimony together and putting it online. So thank you for listening. God bless you all. Thank you.